What we'd like to do is do our introductions for today. I see that everyone is in here. Hello to everyone. We welcome all of our visitors. My name is Kathy Olewski and I am the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's webinar educational webinar series. And I'm a patient living with MPA vasculitis as well. And in today's webinar, we're looking for a patient perspective also. So I'll do double duty as your host and as the patient story. We're super excited today to have our guest speaker, Dr. Kinana Yassin. I hope I didn't slaughter the first name there. Dr. Yassin was awarded the 2020 Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium VCRC Vasculitis Foundation Fellowship. She's currently a junior faculty member in the Department of Rheumatic and Immunologic Diseases at Cleveland Clinic, and also an assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. She, her interests involve all forms of vasculitis, especially small vessel vasculitis, including GPA, MPA, EGPA, IgA, cutaneous vasculitis, and drug-induced vasculitis. Now, welcome, Dr. Yassine. We appreciate you being here. It's a pleasure to be here today. Welcome, everyone, virtually. My name is Kinana Yassine, and thank you so much, Kathy, for the nice introduction. Um, here is my disclosure. Um, the main points that we are going to discuss today, what is active disease, active vasculitis, what remission means, relapse, and organ damage, and what are the main goals of therapy in vasculitis. disease. So as a general approach for patients with vasculitis, with active vasculitis, and this is a, could be a new patient with vasculitis or even someone with relapse, when we are feel, okay, their disease is active, then we choose induction therapy. And induction therapy is a strong immunosuppressive therapy that mainly includes high dose of glucocorticoids or prednisone, in addition to a second agent. And we usually choose the second agent based on the severity of the active vasculitis. Severe vasculitis means life or organ threatening vasculitis, similar to someone with renal failure, neuropathy, versus non-severe vasculitis. And this is, it means non-life or organ threatening vasculitis, such as sinus disease, joint, or skin. After using induction therapy, we reassess the patient after six months usually, and we reevaluate, are they in remission or they are not in remission? And we will talk later on, we will define what remission means. If they are in remission, then great. We will switch from induction therapy to something called maintenance therapy. And this is usually less aggressive therapy comparing to the induction, but it's a treatment used to keep the vasculitis in remission and quiet. If unfortunate, and this is very minority of cases, they did not achieve remission, then we have to switch for another medication for induction therapy. So active vasculitis means active symptoms due to the overwhelming inflammation in the blood vessels causing a lot of symptoms. Remission means absence of active symptoms related to or due to the active vasculitis. But unfortunately, remission does not really mean absence of symptoms, does not feel that you are, you are, you're going to be cured, does not mean that you're going to feel 100% healthy again, as before the vasculitis onset. The main treatment goals in vasculitis are to induce remission, control the inflammation, prevent further progression of the vasculitis, reduce death rate and mortality rate, prevent any further organ damage like renal failure, improve quality of life of the patients, prevent further relapse or flare of the disease in the future. But unfortunately, there is no cureness. Our treatment still, they, I mean, they don't cure vasculitis and may not resolve the symptoms completely 100%. We're going to start with giant cell arteritis, and giant cell arteritis, or GCA, is considered the most common form of primary systemic vasculitis in the United States. Patients with active GCA may experience temporal headaches, jaw claudication, and this is means jaw pain and fatigue while eating food, fever, weight loss, painless vision loss or double vision, arm or leg 
fatigue during activities called claudication. They may have elevated inflammatory markers called sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein. And then lastly, they may have other condition in addition to the giant cell arteritis called PMR or polymyalgia aromatica, and usually will cause a stiffness and pain in the shoulders and the hips. After induction therapy, we reassess the patient and while remission, we expect giant cell arteritis patient not to have the same temporal headaches they had in the beginning and during the active vasculitis, not to have the jaw claudication, not to have the fever and the weight loss. We expect them to have normal inflammatory markers and no polymyalgia symptoms. However, they may continue to have vision loss and arm and leg claudication during activities, even during remission. And this is what we call it, what we call it chronic organ damage. So this is something could be irreversible with our induction therapy. At any time during remission, could be a month after achieving remission, could be few months, could be on or off therapy. Relapses do happen in GCA patient, and this is more than 50% of cases. And at the time of the relapse or fair, patient, they may experience, again, the same kind of headaches they had in the beginning, the same jaw claudication they had during the active vasculitis. They may have new or worsening vision loss in addition to whatever they ended up during the remission. And their uh, inflammatory markers, they may be elevated again. But this is with exceptions. Sometimes if they are on medication called tocilizumab, so we cannot rely 100% on the inflammatory markers. And this is one of the disadvantage of this medication. Second, tachyaso arteritis patients. And this is another rare form of large vessel vasculitis, mainly uh, occur in, um, occurs in, in young female patients. During active tachyaso arteritis, patient, they may have bruits. And bruits, it means abnormal sounds over the arteries during to, due to abnormal blood flow. They may have asymmetric blood pressure between both arms, arms and lower extremities and the legs. They may have elevated inflammatory markers, areas of stenosis, narrowing or dilation aneurysms of their arteries on the images. After induction therapy and while in remission, they may continue to have the same sound, the same bruits over the arteries. They may continue to have the asymmetric blood pressure between the arms and the legs. They may continue to have the extremity claudication during activity, and they may continue to have the stenosis and the aneurysm on their images. These are all chronic damage, so it could be also irreversible with our induction therapy. The same thing with the giant cell arteritis patients at any time during remission, they may experience relapse on or off treatment. And then again, they will end up with a new area of stenosis or aneurysm in their, um, in their arteries on the images. Their inflammatory markers will be abnormal again if they were elevated in the beginning. They may have a new areas of vessels involvement during relapse or flare. Then moving to medium vessel vasculitis, and the most common one is polyarthritis nodosa. Though this is something rare, we don't see a lot because of the hepatitis B vaccination nowadays. But patients with polyarthritis nodosa during active disease may experience neuropathy, may experience skin rash and ulcers, may have fever, weight loss, may have elevated inflammatory markers, sedimentation rate, and CRP. In addition, on their images, we may found also we may find also stenosis or aneurysms of their arteries. After induction therapy, we reassess, hopefully they are in remission. But during the remission, they may continue to have neuropathy and areas of stenosis or aneurysm of their arteries. This is what we call it chronic organ damage, something irreversible with our induction therapy. Relapses are not very common in polyarthritis nodosa may be reported between 5 to 20% um, of the cases, but could happen anytime during remission. They may experience, again, new neuropathy, new skin rash, new fever, weight loss, elevated inflammatory markers, and new changes on their images. Then we have NK-associated vasculitis, and we have like three groups of disorders in this category. During active NK-associated vasculitis patients, they may experience neuropathy, skin rash or ulcers, 
fever, weight loss. They may have pulmonary symptoms such as cough, shortness of breath, coughing up blood called hemoptysis. They may have sinusitis, chronic sinus congestion, otitis media, ear fullness, hearing loss, narrowing of their airway. They may have kidney problem, renal disease. They may have blood in their urine called hematuria, protein in their urine called proteinuria, and they may have abnormal kidney function as well. They may have as well elevated inflammatory markers. After induction therapy, six months, we reassess the patient again. And then, okay, they, most of them, they will go in remission with our current therapy. But during the remission, they may continue to experience neuropathy. They may continue to experience pulmonary symptoms, such as shortness of breath, cough. Um, they may continue to experience hearing loss, narrowing of their airways, and um, abnormalities of their urine analysis or even abnormalities of the renal function. At any time during their remission, they may experience relapse. And we will talk about the um, relapse risk on treatment, off treatment. And then during the relapse or flare, they will get new neuropathy, new skin rash, new symptoms, new findings, and then their inflammatory markers will be abnormal. And I'm gonna give a um, few examples here. So the first patient um, presented in June of 2020. At that time, um, she had cough, shortness of breath, and she was coughing a blood hemoptysis on chest images. She was found to have white shadows in her, in her lungs. Um, and she was found to have NK associated vasculitis, GPA, granulomatosis with polyandritis after induction therapy. And when the disease was in remission, you can see complete clearance of the white shadow after a year um, during remission. In comparison, going to the second patient, she presented almost with the same symptoms. She had shortness of breath, she had cough, but she was not coughing up blood. And then on chest images, she did have areas of scarring in the small circle, an area um, of active inflammation and acute inflammation on chest images. After induction therapy, almost a year after we repeated the images, afterwards, two years after we repeated the images, she continued to have shortness of breath. She continued to have cough. So if you can, if you can see, the areas of inflammation did improve after induction, but the areas of scarring did not improve. And this is what we call it chronic damage. Both are considered in remission, but one of them, the first patient, did have complete resolution of the, of the initial findings of the chest images. The second one did not and ended up with chronic damage and scarring in the lungs. This is another example. This patient presented with digital finger gangrene, and also he did have um, renal failure. He was on dialysis where the serum creatinine in the beginning went up to 7.7. .7. After induction therapy, we achieved remission. Unfortunately, we could not save the, two, the tips of the two fingers, but he did not get any, any lesions in the other fingers. And you could see that the renal function did improve. So his creatinine went down to 2.5. Now it didn't go back to normal 100%, but at least he's not on dialysis. And with that, we still we call him, we, we still we call the disease is in remission because it did not progress further, right? So this, this is why we called it remission for him. Now coming to relapse and the same term we call it, you know, flare is the same term. Um, it, is means recurrence of the symptoms or have appearance of new symptoms due to the active vasculitis after achieving remission. Could be any time, a month after remission, two months, a year, five years, could be any time, could be on treatment or off treatment. And why is that relapses are very, very common in vasculitides? Because they are treatable, but they are not curable conditions yet. Our treatment does not cure vasculitis. For example, in GCA patient, the relapse rate is almost more than 50% of cases, and most of them, they are during the first year of diagnosis. Female gender, patients with the arm and the extremity claudication phenotype, patients, they are treated less than a year with glucocorticoids or prednisone, they are at higher risk for relapse. Second one, polyarthritis nodosa, and I mentioned usually the relapse in polyarthritis nodosa is not that common, between two to 25%. And then NK vasculitis patients on treatment is 5%, off treatment up to 80%. 
and usually predictors for relapse for NK associated vasculitis patient, anyone who had previous relapse, anyone with granulomatosis with polyangitis more than microscopic polyangitis, someone with antigen called proteinase 3 more than myeloperoxidase, and short term maintenance treatment less than 24 months. But calling relapse and confirming relapse is not an easy task for the physician and for so many reasons. First of all, symptoms are not only unique for vasculitides and many other disorders may cause similar symptoms. You know, headaches is not only for a giant cell arthritis patient. Vision loss also is not only for giant cells, so it could be tricky. It might be very challenging to differentiate between the chronic organ damage and between the new symptoms. So this is some, it, it needs, you know, you need an expert to, in order to differentiate what is organ damage, what is a new vasculitis. We give medication, they do have so many adverse events. They increase the risk for infection. They cause a lot of blood counts and liver toxicities, a lot of side effects that may mimic the, the vasculitis symptoms. Then fourth, inflammatory markers are not really perfect test. Um, they are not only specific to vasculitis, and they might be normal in, in, some of the in some of the patients with true vasculitis and true flare. So we cannot rely 100% on the inflammatory markers. And then we have serology, and the most common one we get asked about is the NK testing and the NK titer, you know, in NK-associated vasculitis patients. So the utility of following the NK antibodies is really controversy. And um, the correlation between the titer and the disease activity, I mean, it's, it's very controversy again, you know, and we cannot rely 100% on it, but it's, it's one piece of the puzzle. So we do use it sometimes. And then lastly, and the most, and the most thing we get asked about, you know, in a clinic is the fatigue. It's something very common in patients with autoimmune disease in someone with vasculitis. With vasculitis. Um, so many factors can, can cause, so many other disorders may cause fatigue. If you are anemic, you're going to feel tired. If you have thyroid disease, you're going to feel tired. If you have sleep apnea, you're going to feel tired. If your doctor is saying that your vasculitis is in remission, but you are still feeling tired and fatigued, it means we should look for another reason for that fatigue. Again, relapse, confirming relapse is really is a, is, a, is a puzzle piece. It has four elements, the clinical symptoms, physical examination findings, laboratory tests, and then images. And one of the most important questions you're gonna ask, for how long I'm gonna stay on therapy? This is a very good question, but unfortunately, we really, we don't know the exact answer to it. There is no specific guidelines. It's a very complex decision, but it's a shared decision between the patient and the physician. And I consider many factors when I'm making that decision. First, how severe the, the initial presentation of the vasculitis. If someone was on dialysis and then the renal I mean, the renal function recovered or improved, I would think twice before I stop maintenance therapy. If someone had sinus disease or joint pain and, and skin rash in the beginning, then I would say, okay, we could consider stopping maintenance therapy. Then the second thing I look at how much organ damage we got. If a patient had severe neuropathy in the beginning and ended up with severe neuropathy pain, then I would think twice about stopping maintenance therapy. It's if someone is having a lot of side effect from the medication, recurrent infection, then I would say, let's stop, the, let's stop the medication, it should be fine. But I think the key here is really close monitoring, you know, for any early sign of relapse, blood test, images if necessary, and seeing the doctor very often. I think that's the most important um, key here. And to summarize, really remission, means absence of active symptoms related to active vasculitis, but does not really mean absence of symptoms. Feeling 100% healthy again does not mean cureness. Vasculitides are treatable, but they are not still curable disorders. Unfortunate relapse or flare means recurrence of the symptoms or, or appearance of new symptoms after achieving remission may occur on off treatment at any time during the remission, a month after, two months, a year, five years after, 
and there are no perfect test biomarkers to detect relapse yet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yassine, that was great. You can stop sharing your screen now if you don't mind. And thank you. I know um, I got a message from one or two of you. You've been um, wondering if you can ask questions in the in the Q and A. And yes, you can. Please do ask questions in the Q and A. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Yassine. I feel like that answered a lot of the questions that we previously had submitted, but we're still going to ask them. But before we get to the question and answer section with Dr. Yassine. We mentioned that there is a uh, patient perspective in all of our webinars and I get to be the patient. So um, I was asked to answer a few questions and to tell a little bit about myself as a patient. Uh, I'm not gonna be the same as everybody, but I was diagnosed with MPA vasculitis in 2009 at the age of 50. Uh, prior to diagnosis, I was a professional athlete and a business owner with my husband. I spent about a year and a half going to 13 different doctors to try and find out why I was experiencing random pain and a lot of fatigue and a blood test, long story short, you all know it's always a long story, a blood test with a rheumatologist determined that I was likely in kidney failure. And so a kidney biopsy was ordered. And then my diagnosis of MPA vasculitis was con confirmed through that biopsy. I entered the hospital at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I spent 21 days going through many procedures and treatments to become stable enough to go home. And I spent the next six years between remission and relapse with remission lasting about a year in some cases. And finally, after those six years, my doctor told me I was in long-term remission off treatment. I remained that way for nine years until a recent flare, and I'm currently in treatment for that flare. So now to the questions. First one is, I'd like to ask Kathy about her long period of remission. How much were you able to resume your normal activities when the disease wasn't active? Well, the answer to that is, what? I wasn't ever normal, not the same way I was before I was diagnosed, but I did find a new normal. And by new normal, I mean, you know, the first two years of my journey, I didn't feel like I was making progress and I, I knew I needed to build strength. And that wasn't, I was still thinking I would get back to who I was as an athlete beforehand. Um, it, it, so I guess my answer to that is I resumed activities but I was not the same. I, I found a new normal. And the second part of that question is what were the main symptoms that did not occur during your remission that usually do impact you now that you're in a relapse, you're in a relapse? Well, as I said, the first two years were a journey of realizing that I just wouldn't go back to normal and that I had to build strength. So that's what I did. I hired a personal trainer to get me strong. I, I saw him twice a week. I started walking with my friends and started biking with my husband. So as far as symptoms, I can tell you that I was mostly pain-free during those nine years. And, and then when I saw my doctor for a checkup last fall, we determined that I was having the traveling pain again that I remember from when I was first diagnosed and a general feeling of not being well. And with the change in my labs, he determined that I was in a flare. And I do want to say, I, I see my doctor every three months, and I've known for about a year and a half that my labs were changing a little bit. So it wasn't a surprise. And he did tell me he felt that my disease would come creeping back in after that remission, and it wouldn't just hit me the same way it did when I was first diagnosed. Next question, Kathy, are you trying to get more rest than usual during your relapse? Are you making a point to conserve your energy and get more sleep at this time? Well, I'd love to say yes to that. <laughs> it's a good question because our family business is in a bit of a transition and I was trying to mentor a few people so that I could begin to cut back on my job. Um, I definitely have days when I give myself permission to take time off and just rest. I've stopped most of my activities outside of my house, except for seeing family. And 
I'm not trying to exercise as much as I did um, for the first month. I, I did try for the, the first month after I was in remission because I was also in denial. I mean, when I was in a flare, because I was also in denial. I, I, I'm one of those strong-minded people who think I can muscle my way through anything. Um, and that just wound up not being true as all of you know. <laughs> I'm definitely getting more sleep and I'm, I'm very focused on eating well. So these are my goals to control what I can of resting and trying to allow my body to recover. The next, the last question I got was in my fourth year of remission, and it's wonderful, um, that they said a part of me wants to focus on staying in remission, but I admit that every time I've had a cold or flu or especially COVID, I get anxiety about going into relapse. How do we find a balance to enjoy our remission, but also be aware of relapse? Well, I'm not sure I'm the authority on this, but I can tell you that my perspective has changed over the years. For all of those nine years in remission, I saw my doctor every three months for labs and a physical exam, just like I said earlier. But I got worked up the day before every visit. Is he going to tell me I'm in a flare? I'm just like the rest of you, serious pain, every bout of the flu, every stomach virus, everything makes me wonder if I'm going into a flare. However, what I've learned now is that I need to focus on being healthy when I am healthy and enjoying everything that I can enjoy. I often tell other patients that I feel like the nine years that I was in remission were nine years of me getting stronger. So hopefully any remission or illness would not be as hard on my body. Um, so that's it for all my questions. And, and, and now um, I will tell you that I thank you for all those questions. Those were submitted ahead of time. And uh, now we're gonna talk to Dr. Yassine about her questions. But first she's been looking in the chat room and um, I actually have to find her questions that I'm going to ask her. So that's gonna take me a second. Um, but Dr. Yassine, uh, is there anything in the chat room that you saw that you, uh, the, the Q and A? that you want to answer? I saw a few questions about avocapan, and this is a new oral medication that um, got approved for NK-associated vasculitis um, almost a year ago. It does not substitute prednisone or steroid. It's still, we use it in conjunction, but the dose with this, the dose of the steroid, it, it's less comparing to the past. So it did, it did help in reducing the glucocorticoid toxicity, the side effect, um, it's promising drug um, for patients with um, kidney disease. Um, it did help, you know, a lot with renal recovery, reducing the protein urea, protein in the urine. Um, it's a promising drug. We, we still we we need more experience with it, you know, in terms of other manifestations in NK associated vasculitis. There was another question about a saluzumab in giant cell arteritis patients. Um, it, again, it does not substitute the same thing with the avocapan. It does not substitute the glucocorticoids. You still, you need to be on the glucocorticoids in the beginning. It does not work fast. So to see the full efficacy of the tesaluzumab, it does take almost three months. So you cannot just like, you know, risk the vision. So that's why we need to start the glucocorticoids and then start the tesaluzumab, um, 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 at the same time. Um, how, after stopping maintenance therapy, how often um, should I see my doctor and how often should I do blood test? Honestly, I try to do, for vasculitis patients on or off treatment, I try to do labs on them every month. Um, the reason why, because, you know, specifically kidney involvement might be completely asymptomatic patient, they feel okay, probably. Um, but then when we are doing a urine analysis, we are detecting blood and protein in the urine, and this is, could be the early sign. So detecting the, uh, you know, the protein and the blood in the urine first without having abnormal kidney function, that's a very good sign. That's a very good thing. And potentially we may just like not have abnormal kidney function later on. So I would try to do them once a month, once every two months. This is what I would do. 
and have good relationship with the doctor, you know, very um, not necessary to be seen every three months or every six months, but, you know, um, like messaging the doctor for any early sign or any early symptom of the active vasculitis. That's a key in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Yassine. I, I know you caught a few of those right there. I did want to make two announcements. One is we are planning a follow-up webinar to answer a lot of the questions we don't get to today. So don't panic. We'll try very hard to get them all. Um, and also some of you are putting questions in the chat box and Dr. Yassine probably won't see them. So if you put them in the Q&A section, that's where she will see them. But we're going to actually go to a bunch of questions that were submitted in advance. And I'm going to answer one that was to me, how often did your physicians monitor you while you're weaning off? Well, I'm weaning off right now, sort of. I'm taking less and I see my doctor every month right now. That's his call. All the doctors are different, but in, in my normal months when I was in remission, I saw him every three months for nine years, every three months. And I didn't mind at all. I love seeing him. <laughs> Okay, now Dr. Yassine, some uh, questions for you. The first one is, are CRP and SE and SED rate the primary blood tests used to identify a flare? They are not perfect tests. Um, many other conditions such as infection, cancer, trauma, recent vaccines, any, any even like cold infection may affect the inflammatory markers. On the other side, even patients with active vasculitis or active relapse or flare, they may have, you know, just like normal inflammatory markers. So it does not, having normal inflammatory markers does not rule out active vasculitis or a relapse. So we cannot rely 100%. Again, it's a puzzle piece. You need the clinical symptoms, you need the physical exam findings, the test and the images, and then how much what piece we are missing. And like, it's just, it's a, it's a clinical judgment by the end of the day. Right. And the next one is how do you detect flares that may be happening internally, but are not symptomatic and don't show up on blood tests. I've read that blood tests don't always reflect what we may, may be happening on a cellular or venous level. That's sort of what you were just addressing, but yeah. just to be more specific. In this cases, we may need to do images such as um, plain, x-ray or even computer tomography, CT scan, MRI, and sometimes we may even need to do biopsy, just like to confirm whether this is vasculitis or not vasculitis. So this is a tricky situation. I tell you this next question, I've, I've had this thought so many times, how can I tell the difference between a relapse and a run-of-the-mill minor illness? How do you know when it's flare, not something else like the flu or a common cold? any way to distinguish. And I think one other piece of that that we saw from another person that kind of goes along with it, when is it an emergency when, when you should contact your doctor? Having I, I would problems? say contact, not for minor stuff, but contact your doctor for anything like such as fever, cough, significant cough, something is not going away in a few days. Of course, when you start coughing up blood or having hemoptysis, you should really contact the doctor the same day or the next day. If there is there is a new numbness or tingling sensation bothering you at night, waking you up from sleep, you know, it's something persistent, it's not going away, then you should contact your doctor. Is there any way to differentiate between common colds and between, you know, Specifically in NK associated vasculitis, they do have, you know, runny nose sometimes, sinus congestion all the time. It's even tricky for the doctor to tell sometimes to differentiate between the active vasculitis and the infection. And sometimes we rely heavily on our ENT specialist to, to take a look there, you know, do a culture and just making sure there is no infection because, you know, infections are way more than more common than the vasculitis. So you have, and plus, most of most of the patients they are immunosuppressed, so they are at higher risk for infections comparing, you know, to other and healthy individuals. So, yeah, I know, Doctor, you've seen that. I over the years I had lots of things like that come up, and I I used the portal. That was my way of direct messaging my doctor. I think that that's been a great. That wasn't around in two thousand and nine, so I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Um, 
Another patient says, how do, how do you know if you're in a flare when you already experience almost daily symptoms of not feeling well? For instance, one of our patients said, I was diagnosed with GPA in July, 2022. I have some symptoms that have eased up, you know, like painful, bloody nose, but also some are still present, but not as intense, like cough, pressure in my ears, my feet get numb. How can I possibly find remission or relapse with these conditions, especially the constant fatigue? So that's kind of a dual question. How do you know and, and how does it occur? So as I mentioned during the slides, um, remission does not really mean, you know, absence of symptoms and feeling healthy again, 100%. And, you know, a lot of the patients do end up with chronic symptoms. Neuropathy is one of the most difficult manifestations in NK-associated vasculitis and in polyarthritis nodosa. Most of the patients, they do end up with severe neuropathy pain. Um, but the main point from, from the induction therapy and the treatment in vasculitis that we don't have new nerves and new extremities involved. That's the main thing, you know, if it's staying in that area that was involved in the beginning, then we still, we call it a remission. It's not progressing. Once we see it progressing and moving to new areas, then we are, we're gonna say it's active again, it's coming again. This is a relapse and a flare. So I know I, a few of these questions were, you did touch on in your presentation, but maybe the patients just need a little more thorough explanation. So with a flare, do you get your same prior symptoms or can you get new ones, either, either in conjunction with the old ones or alone? And are flares always acute events or can you have signs of a flare that are more subtle? Mm -hmm. So by definition, relapse or flare, it means recurrence of the symptoms that you know the patient had initially or appearance of new symptoms related to the active vasculitis. So you may start with sinus disease in the beginning and the doctor will put you on medication and then later on, you may develop renal disease or kidney disease, okay? So, that's why the close follow-up with the doctor, the close monitoring of the blood test is very, very, very essential here. I forgot the second question. Well, I think you addressed it anyway. And this one uh, also, I feel like we've been over this, but I, I feel like it's just something that is not understood. So if we could just touch on it one more time, is the flare the same thing as the relapse? If not, what makes them different? Does an increase in flares indicate a relapse? Do you treat a patient differently depending if they're in a flare or a full relapse? I think this is a good one for you to restate. It's, they are the same terminology. It's the same. Relapse is the same as a flare. And then another one is they, they just want to know, um, not exactly clear on remission, is remission stable labs? But there, you said there was so much more to it than just stable labs. So... Yeah blood test or else no okay um let's see so many of these you did answer what percentage of people get flares how often do the majority of people get flares how can i avoid a flare how common are flares i mean in general relapse is very very common in i think i would say in every form of vascular disease but depends what type of the vasculitis the patient has right so for instance in giant cell arteritis, the relapse rate is more than 50%. In NK-associated vasculitis, on treatment is like 5%, off treatment is almost 80%. And as I mentioned, polyarthritis nodosa, not that common, maybe up to 20%. So it really depends, you know, are you on treatment, off treatment, what type of vasculitis do you have? So the, and what, what other risk factors maybe even you have, you know, will put you at high risk for having relapse. Okay, and here's a good one. Can you get a flare or relapse right after a reduction infusion, or is that unlikely? Um, so it it does take time for the rituximab, um, in our opinion, you know, to to start working. So that's why we have the prednisone on board, and usually at that time, the the dose of the the glucocorticoids will be high, will be approximately around like sixty or fifty. So by the time you know, when when the patient, they will get the second dose of the rituximab, they will stay on the 50 and 50 milligram or 60 milligram of prednisone 
it, it should really be enough to hold the progression of the vasculitis at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we have two, it's not retoxic up and medication and vasculitis. They are not called steroid sparing agents. They are called second agent in addition to help with the glucocorticoids, not to replace 100%, so. Right. So this patient said, I was treated for polyarthritis nodosa 22 years ago and relapsed late September, 2022. Wow, that was a long time in remission. My rheumatologist has raised the possibility that co the COVID vaccine and boosters may have caused the relapse. Are there any reports that may substantiate this? Are there any environmental triggers that can bring on a flare or relapse such as exposure to chemicals or products that a patient is allergic to? It's not common, but yes, in the past few years, um, there have been a few reports about de novo vasculitis or even reactivation of previous vasculitis after COVID-19, but it's not only unique for COVID-19 vaccine. It's also reported after flu vaccine sometimes, you know, hepatitis vaccine. I don't think we can confirm such such association, you know, and correlation 100%, but also we cannot rule it out um, 100%. So it is possible. I did, I did want to say that I, there was some conversation with my doctor after nine years in remission that I had shingles last August and he felt like that may have pushed me into my flare that was already on the edge or something. Um, the next patient says, are there any rules or routes to follow to determine how long one should maintain immune system suppression after achieving remission? I've decided after five years since my only flare and eight years since my initial diagnosis to no longer immune suppress, but to test quarterly. But I wonder if there are any clear or bright lines as what to do. Again, it depends on the type of the vasculitis, but if we are talking about NK-associated vasculitis, the studies show that um, at least for two years, for 24 months, and then after that, you could discuss with your doctor about stopping maintenance therapy. Again, depends on the factors, right? And we, I did mention that in my last slides, if someone really had severe presentation and ended up with severe, significant organ damage, I would think twice before stopping maintenance therapy. Understood. Um, this is what I call the invisible disease thing and what others call it. What do you say to caregivers or partners who are, when you're in a period of remission, my family and friends see me doing better now that I'm enjoying remission and they always assume I'm cured. One of them said she was glad that I'm all better now. How do I explain that it could change at any time and that I'm better, but I'm not cured? Maybe that's exactly how you say it. <laughs> This is exactly, I'm not cured, it's still there. I need close monitoring, close follow-up, close testing. Um, I may relapse at any time, no one can predict, but I would say enjoy every day in remission, you know, enjoy your day. Um, no one can predict the future, right? You may, you may not get relapse. No one can, no one, no one can, no one can tell, right? So. Right. It, it's very hard for other people to understand vasculitis. I've always said we need an elevator speech and I sort of have one, but it, it has to adapt constantly. Is a biopsy a way to tell if you are in remission, if MPO anca vasculitis with renal fa failure and then some recovery? Sometimes, yes, we need to redo another kidney biopsy in order to confirm a relapse. Oh, here's one for me. <laughs> Kathy, what was the best support you had from your family or friends? What can we do to help? Um, my family, they're rock stars. <laughs> my, I have a great husband and I have a couple of great kids and a great best friend. And I have, that's where I get my therapy. <laughs> when I am just having a terrible day, um, I can't tell you how often I just rattle off all the nonsensical things that are happening to me to my husband and he says yeah I think you just need more rest today I think you should like not work today I think you should do this so um I have a good family and friend group around me and there's a whole lot of people that know me that don't know that I'm in a flare because I haven't been in so long they don't even remember that I'm sick so I mean, I think it's different for everybody, but that was 
you know, a question for me is uh, for you, Dr. Yassine, is it unusual to have uh, takiosis for five years with no remission? Therapy has been changed four times. Now have second aneurysm in my aorta. Last one got to five centimeters pretty quickly. Oh, wow. That's, that's unusual. Um, usually takiosis arteritis patients are responsive to glucocorticoids and to steroid at least, you know. So I'm assuming when they are switching therapy, they are increasing the global corticoids um, dose. So I have to tell you all, the time has come. <laughs> we have done the best we could with the questions we got in advance and the questions we got today. We have had overwhelming questions and overwhelming requests for this actual webinar. And um, I'm very thankful to the Vasculitis Foundation for doing this and supporting this for us. I think it um, like education is the thing that helped me so much over the years. And you know, thank you to everybody that came today. And thank you so much, Dr. Yassine. I loved your presentation. I felt like, and I got that comment from several people in the chat that it answered so many questions. Oh, thank my, you so much. Thank you for having me today. Thank you everybody.